السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام So uh, Dr. Lawan Lagamdi is the one who's gonna start, right? So we have two minutes to um, start the session. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. So we welcome you guys to our new academic activity and the new year. And we hope inshallah, everybody's gonna gain new information, new knowledge inshallah. And we welcome our uh, new residents also. I think, uh, I, do you have anything to say before starting the sessions? Or do you want us to start directly? No, I have nothing to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So one minute, uh, Rowan, and we're going to start, OK? Sure. OK. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rowan Al-Ghamdi, cardiac surgery resident, uh, R3 from Prince Sultan Cardiac Center uh, in Riyadh. Inshallah, today I'll be presenting uh, the first lecture in our academic activity this year, uh, which is about the anatomy of the cardiac chamber conduction system. Following that, I'll be uh, presenting another lecture about the anatomy of the great vessels and the coronary vessels. So these are the objective. Uh, of course, the anatomy of the four cardiac chamber, the four valve the conduction system, and finally, the mediastinal nerve and its relation to the heart. So the overall shape of the heart is a three-sided pyramid located in the middle of the mediastinum, the apex, the sternocostal surface, which is the anterior surface, the base, which is the posterior surface, and the diaphragmatic, which is the inferior surface. The, diaph the diagram here uh, shows the heart within the middle of the mediastinum with the, uh, with the patient supine on the operating table. The long axis like, uh, lies parallel to the int, uh, interventricular septum, and the short axis is perpendicular to the long axis at the level of the atrioventricular valve. It has two edges, the acute margin, which lies inferiorly and described as a sharp angle between the sternocostal and the diaphragmatic surface. The obtuse margin, which lies superiorly, and it um, is much more diffuse. Anteriorly, the heart is covered by the sternum and the costal cartilage of the third, fourth, and fifth ribs. The lungs contract, uh, uh, that contact the lateral surface of the heart. The right lung overlies the, uh, the right surface of the heart and reaches to the midline. But on the left lung, uh, it retract, retract from the midline in the area of the cardiac notch. The heart has an extensive diaphragmatic surface inferiorly. Posteriorly, it lies on the esophagus and the tracheal bifurcation and bronchi that extends into the lung. Um, it lies within the pericardium, which is attached to the wall of the great vessels and the diaphragm, consists of two layers, the fibrous pericardium, which is made of tough connective tissue and is continuous, uh, continuous with the central tendon uh, of the diaphragm. The serous pericardium, which uh, itself has two layers, the visceral and the parietal pericardium. 
The visceral pericardium, this is the inner layer that is in direct contact with the heart. It extends uh, uh, several centimeters back uh, onto the wall of the great vessels. The parietal pericardium, which is the outer layer, which lines the inner surface of the fibrous pericardial sac. A thin film of lubricating fluid lies within the pericardial cavity between the two serous layers. Uh, it's around 5 to 10 uh, ml. We have two pericardial sinuses. The first is the transverse sinus, which is the tunnel-shaped passage posterior to the aorta and pulmonary trunk and anterior to the superior vena cava. The oblique sinus, which is an inverted U-shaped reflection of the vena cava and pulmonary vein, it lies behind the left atrium and in between the left and right pulmonary vein. So it separates the base of the heart from the descending aorta and esophagus. Uh, internally, the right atrium has three basic parts, the atrial appendage, the vestibule, and the venous component. The atrial appendage has a triangular shape with a wide junction to the venous component. Uh, the most characteristic and constant feature of the morphology of the right atrium is that the pectinate muscle within the appendage uh, extends around the entire parietal margin. The venous component is the SVC, the IVC, and the coronary sinus, which receive uh, the systemic venous return. The vestibule, which is a smooth wall uh, atrial myocardium that insert into the leaflet of the tricuspid valve. Uh, the, uh, this view uh, of the right atrium seen in surgical uh, uh, orientation shows the pectinate muscle lining the appendage. Uh, it also shows the uh, smooth vestibule uh, surrounding the orifice of the tricuspid valve and the uh, superior vena cava, the anterior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. Externally, the junction of the appendage and the venous component is identified by a prominent groove called the terminal uh, groove or sulcus terminalis. Uh, this corresponds internally and forms a ridge called the terminal crest. Um, you can see also the, uh, the station valve, also known as the valve of the IVC, which is an embryological remnant of the uh, IVC that during the fetal life, it helps to divert the oxygenated blood from the IVC toward the foramen oval to escape the pulmonary circulation. This remnant usually regress after birth and is considered a benign uh, finding in majority of cases. The fossa ovalis, um, just briefly talking about it, uh, during the fetal development, the foramen oval allows the blood to pass from the right to left atrium, bypassing the non-functional fetal lung a flap of tissue called the septum primum acts as the uh, valve over the foramen oval during that time. After birth, the introduction of air into the lung causes the pressure in the pulmonary circulation system to drop. This change in pressure uh, pushes the septum primum against the uh, atrial septum, closing the foramen and leaving uh, this depression. Uh, the three leaflet uh, of the tricuspid valve ref reflects their anatomical uh, location. The anterior leaflet, which is the largest leaflet, the septal leaflet, and the posterior leaflet, which is the smallest leaflet. The leaflets uh, join together over three prominent zones, uh, usually described as the commissure. So we have the anterior septal, the anterior posterior, and the posterior septal commissure. There is no well-formed collagenous um, annulus for the tricuspid valve. Instead, the AV groove falls directly into the tricuspid valve leaflet at the vestibule, and the atrial and ventricular myocardium are separated by the fibrofatty tissue of the groove. 
So the entire parietal attachment of the tricuspid valve usually uh, encircled by the right coronary artery running within the atrioventricular groove. Uh, there are three papillary muscles that support the tricuspid valve. Um, this is the papillary muscle. The anterior papillary muscle, which is the largest, that arises from the moderator band and support the anterior leaflet of the valve and the zone of uh, a position between the anterior and posterior leaflet. The medial papillary muscle that support the septal leaflet of the valve and the zone of opposition between the septal and anterior leaflet, and the posterior papillary muscle, which is the smallest, that support the posterior leaflet of the valve, and the zone of opposition between the posterior and septal leaflet. Like the uh, right atrium, the left atrium has also uh, three components, the appendage, the vestibule, and the venous component. The left atrial appendage is long and narrow. It has a different uh, variation in size and shape, but are uh, generally a finger-like projection from the left atrium, lies to the left of the mitral valve orifice. Uh, the vestibule is directly continuous with the smooth atrial wall of the pulmonary venous component and inserts directly into the posterior leaflet uh, of the mitral valve. There is an important difference between uh, the relationship of the appendage and the vestibule between the left and the right atrium. In the right atrium, uh, as I said, the, the pectinate muscle within the atrial appendage um, is extended all around. Uh, in contrast, in the left atrium, the pectinate muscle are located uh, almost exclusively within the appendage. So the left atrium causes a large, smooth wall uh, mus uh, body which uh, represent the, large, the larger part of the left atrial components. Also, unlike the right atrium, the venous component of the left atrium, which is the four pulmonary vein, is larger than the atrial appendage and has a narrow junction. Um, uh, and it's not marked by the terminal groove or terminal cr uh, crest like in the right atrium. Uh, the competency of the mitral valve is maintained by uh, several different co components uh, acting all together. The leaflet, the mitral valve annulus, the papillary uh, muscles, the cordy tendony, and the left ventricle. The mitral valve consists of two leaflets uh, with different appearance, the anterior and the posterior leaflet. The anterior and posterior leaflet are further subdivided uh, into scallops known as A1, A2, A3 in the anterior leaflet and B1, B2, B3 in the posterior leaflet. The anterior mitral leaflet takes up um, approximately two thirds of the cross-sectional area of the mitral valve orifice. And uh, the posterior leaflet is taking up to one third. The mitral annulus is a fibrous ring that is attached to the mitral valve leaflet. Uh, in contrast to the, uh, it contracts and uh, reduces uh, the surface area during systole to help to provide complete closure of the leaflet. Unlike the tricuspid valve, the mitral valve leaflet are supported by a dense collagenous annulus. Uh, the annulus is a kidney shape with the anterior mit mitral annulus taking up to one third of the circumference and the posterior mitral annulus taking up to two thirds of the circumference. Uh, for the mitral valve, we have uh, two papillary muscles, the anterolateral papillary muscle, which has a single head and takes its blood supply from the LED and left circ the posterior medial papillary muscle, which has multiple head and takes its blood supply from the RCA. The cordia tendine are a thin web-like fibrous structure. 
mainly responsible for the end-systolic position of the anterior and posterior leaflet. They arise from the papillary muscle and are classified according to their site of insertion between the free margin and the base of the leaflet. So primary are inserted on the free margin of the leaflet and function to prevent prolapse of the leaflet. The secondary uh, insert on the ventricular surface of the leaflet and relieve the valve of excess uh, tension. The tertiary or basal are limited to the posterior leaflet and connect the leaflet base and mitral annulus to the papillary muscle. Uh, there are anatomical structures uh, close to the annulus that are, are uh, at risk during surgery. Uh, the left circumflex artery, which runs between the base of the left atrial appendage and the anterior commissure, uh, around three to four millimeter from the leaflet attachment, and then moves away from the rest of the posterior annulus. The coronary sinus, which is uh, initially in a lateral position to the posterior leaflet, and then uh, crosses the artery and becomes median, closer to the posterior leaflet attachment, around uh, five millimeters superior to the annulus. The non-coronary and the left coronary aortic cusp, uh, which are in close uh, relationship between the base uh, of the uh, anterior leaflet, The morphology of both the right and left ventricle can be understood uh, by subdividing the ventricle into three anatomical components, the inlet portion, the apical trabecular portion, and the outlet portion. This classification is more helpful than the traditional division of the right ventricle into the sinus and the conus part. So the inlet portion of the right ventricle surrounds the tricuspid valve and its tension uh, apparatus. The second portion is the apical trapecular portion of the right ventricle, which extends out uh, to the apex. Uh, the outlet portion consists of the infundibulum, a uh, circumferential muscular structure that support the leaflet of the pulmonary valve. The pulmonary valve uh, consists of three semilunar uh, leaflet, the right cusp, the left cusp, and the anterior cusp. Uh, because of this uh, semilunar shape of the pulmonary valve leaflet, uh, this valve uh, does not have an annulus in the uh, traditional sense of a ring-like attachment. Instead of a single annulus, uh, three rings can be distinguished anatomically in relation to the pulmonary valve. So superiorly, we have the sinotubular junction of the pulmonary trunk, uh, mark, which marks the level of the commissure. A second ring exists at the ventriculoatrial junction. And a third ring, is the basal ring, which can be constructed by joining together the basal attachment of the three. Uh, the left ventricle can be divided into three components as well. Uh, the same as the right ventricle, you have the inlet, the apical tropical portion, and the uh, outlet portion. The inlet portion is limited by the mitral valve and its tension apparatus. The apical trapecular portion uh, is extended to the apex. Uh, the outlet uh, portion support the aortic valve and consist of both muscular and fibrous uh, portion. This is in contrast to the infundibulum of the right ventricle, which consists in, uh, of muscle only. The aortic root connects the LVOT to the ascending aorta. It extends from the basal attachment of the aortic valve leaflet to the sinotubular uh, junction. Function of the aortic root is um, 
first of all, to guide uh, the unidirectional flow of the large volume of blood with minimal resistance while maintaining laminar flow and optimize the coronary blood flow. It is deeply anchored within the base of the heart between the pulmonary root anteriorly, the mitral and tricuspid valve posteriorly. Um, the competency of the aortic valve is maintained by uh, different component of the aortic root working uh, in harmony. We have the aortic valve leaflet, the sinuses of valsalva and the junctions. The aortic valve is a semilunar valve that is quite similar uh, morphologically to the pulmonary valve. Uh, because of its central location, the aortic valve is related to each of the cardiac chamber and valve. Uh, so uh, through knowledge to this relationship is essential to understanding uh, aortic valve pathology and many congenital cardiac malformations. So the aortic valve consists of the right coronary cusp, the left coronary cusp and the non-coronary cusp. Uh, the commissure are the points of contact between the leaflets uh, on the aortic wall. Uh, behind each leaflet, the aortic valve bulges outward to form uh, to form a sinus. Uh, it extends from the sinotubular junction to the aortic annulus which allows the aortic valve leaflet to fall back during systole, thereby uh, in, uh, enabling the blood to pass unobstructed from the uh, left ventricle to the aorta. There are um, three aortic sinuses, one anterior and two posterior. The left coronary sinus, which give rise to the left coronary uh, artery, the right coronary sinus, which give rise to the right coronary artery, and the non-coronary sinus, which uh, doesn't uh, uh, give rise to any vessels. Uh, the junctions, uh, the sinotubular junction between the distal part of the sinuses and the proximal uh, part of the ascending aorta. The ventriculoatrial junction between the ventricular myocardium and the aortic sinuses, and the basal ring, uh, which is the joining of the inferior aspect of the valve leaflet. So as, as I said, uh, knowledge of the anatomy of the aortic valve and its relationship to the surrounding structure is important to successfully um, doing surgery on the aortic valve, uh, also particularly when the enlargement of the aortic root is required. So structures that are at risk during aortic valve surgery, the bundle of His, which is the most uh, important structure, normally located at the junction between the membranous and ventricular uh, septum, in the subcommissural area between the nun and the right coronary sinus. The membranous septum, uh, it may be uh, injured because of its fragility and the risk of tear following inappropriate uh, suture placement. The thin proximal part of the aortic sinus attached to the annulus is also at risk whenever, uh, for example, very large bites are passed around the annulus rather than through it. The left main coronary artery is also a site of potential injury because of its uh, proximity to the subcommissural area of the right and left uh, sinuses. So moving to the conduction system, uh, the cardiac conduction system consists of the SA node, the anterior, middle, posterior intranodal tract in the right atrium, and the Bachmann bundle in the left atrium. The AV node, bundle of his, the bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers. The SA node is an elliptical or uh, horseshoe shaped subepicardial structure that lies just lateral to the junction of the SBC and the roof of the right atrium at the superior end of the terminal groove. It receives its blood supply from the, uh, from the SA nodal artery. 
which originate from the uh, RCA in 55% of the patient and from the left circ in 45% of the patient. Uh, regardless of its artery of origin, the nodal artery usually courses along the anterior interatrial groove toward the superior cavioatrial junction. Uh, at the cavioatrial junction, the uh, its course become variable and may go either anteriorly or posteriorly, or uh, to rare occasion to both anteriorly and posteriorly around the cavoatrial junction to enter the node. So the artery, artery also, it may rise distally from the uh, circumflex artery, um, where it is at risk of injury when using a superior uh, approach to the mitral valve. Uh, so always keep this anatomical variation in mind. After initiation of the electrical impulse from the SA node, uh, the conduction of depolarization wave from the sinoatrial node across the right atrium to the atrioventricular node occurs three, uh, through three uh, internodal tract the anterior, the middle, and the posterior tract in the right atrium, and the Bachmann bundle in the left atrium, which is a branch of the anterior uh, internodal tract, enabling uh, simultaneous depolarization of both the right atrium and left atrium to maintain synchrony. Uh, in addition to the sinus node, another major area of surgical significance is occupied by the uh, AV node. Uh, this structure lies within the triangle of Koch, and the boundaries uh, for the triangle are the tendon of Tadaro, which is a fibrous uh, structure formed by the uh, junction of the station valve and of the IVC and the Thwesian valve of the coronary sinus. The other boundary is the uh, hinge of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve and the superior margin uh, of the coronary sinus. So the entire atrial component uh, of the AV conduction tissue is contained within the apex of the triangle of Koch, which must be avoided to prevent any surgical damage to the conduction system. The AV node receives its blood supply from the AV nodal artery, which originate from the RCA in around 85 to 90% of the uh, patients, with the remaining 10 to 15% from, uh, originating from the left circ. The Kugel's artery, uh, which is an anastomosis uh, vessel between the proximal right coronary and left circumflex artery that runs through the base of the atrial septum, where it supplies collateral circulation to the AV node. Uh, the bundle of his penetrate directly at the apex of the triangle of Koch before it continues to branch on the uh, ventricular septum into two branches the left bundle branch, which divide into anterior and posterior vesiculi that runs subendocardially down uh, the septal surface of the LV to the apex. The right bundle branch, which runs on the right side of the uh, septum towards the base of the medial papillary muscle of the tricuspid valve into the body of the septo marginal trapeculation and cross the RV cavity through the moderator band. The Purkinje fibers are uh, specialized conduction fibers with a large number of mitochondria that are able to conduct cardiac action potential more quickly and efficiently than any other cell in the heart. So it is located in the inner ventricular wall of the heart in the subendocardium. Purkinje fibers uh, allow the heart to uh, the conduction system to create a synchronized contraction of its ventricle and are therefore uh, essential for maintaining a consistent heart rhythm. Uh, 
Okay, moving to the mediastinal uh, nerves and their relationship to the heart. Um, the vagus and phrenic nerve descend through the mediastinum in close relationship to the heart as they enter through the uh, thoracic inlet. Phrenic nerve is a mixed uh, motor sensory nerve which originate from the C3, C4, and C5 uh, spinal nerve in the neck. Uh, it is the only source of motor innervation to the diaphragm and therefore plays a crucial role in breathing. It also provides sensory supply to the diaphragm, to the pericardium, um, to the mediastinal uh, pleura, and to the peritoneum. It lies on the anterior surface of the anterior uh, scalene muscle and just posterior to the internal mammary artery at the thoracic inlet. So in this position, uh, it is at risk of injury during the uh, lima harvesting. The right and left phrenic nerve have a different course in the uh, thorax, but as a general rule, uh, they descend as lateral as possible while keeping in contact with the mediastinal uh, pleura. Uh, both travel anterior to the hilum on their respective sides. So on the right side, the phrenic nerve courses on the lateral surface of the uh, superior vena, vena cava. <clears throat> Again, uh, it can be injured during dissection for venous cannulation for cardiopulmonary bypass. So the nerve uh, descends anterior to the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary hilum before reflecting onto the right diaphragm. Its terminal branches pass through the caval opening in the diaphragm to supply the central part of the peritoneum. The left phrenic nerve descends in the uh, thorax along the left side of the left subclavian artery. Uh, descend over the left surface of the pericardium, which separate the nerve from the left ventricle. On reaching the diaphragm, the terminal branch pierces the muscle and supply the central part of the peritoneum. The vagus nerve uh, represents the main component of the parasympathetic nervous system to the heart among a number of different function of the vagus nerve. In relation to the heart, it has a parasympathetic effect uh, on the heart, which regulate the heart rate and provide the visceral sensation to the heart through the cardiac branches that arise uh, in the mediastinum. So the right vagus enters the uh, mediastinum by crossing the first part of the subclavian artery and posterior to the innominate artery. It then travels behind the uh, primary right bronchus and esophagus to form the esophag esophageal lexus uh, with the left vagus nerve. The left vagus, it enters the thorax by passing between the left common carotid and the left subclavian uh, arteries, then travels behind the primary left bronchus and into the esophagus to form the esophageal lexus. Uh, and then the vagus nerve exit the uh, thorax along the esophageal hiatus. Um, last part of the uh, first lecture is the surgical incisions, the different surgical approaches. Uh, median sternotomy, anterior lateral thoracotomy, uh, posterior thoracotomy, and bilateral transverse thoracosternotomy. So media sternotomy, uh, this is the most common uh, surgical approach. Uh, the skin incision is made from the sternal notch to uh, the xiphoid sub, uh, to below the xiphoid uh, process. The subcutaneous tissue and fascia are incised to expose the periosteum of the sternum. The sternum is divided uh, longitudinally um, um, in the midline using the saw. After the placement of the sternal, uh, the, the retractor, um, then to, so you can start the operation. The anterior lateral uh, thoracotomy, uh, the right side of the uh, heart can be exposed through the right anterior lateral thoracotomy. 
the patient is positioned in a spine with the right chest elevated to around 30 degree uh, by putting a roll uh, beneath the shoulder. With the lung retracted posteriorly, the pericardium can be opened just anterior to the right uh, phrenic nerve and pulmonary hilum to expose the right and left atria. The incision provides access to both the tricuspid mitral valve and the right coronary artery. Uh, aortic cross clamping, uh, administration of cardioplegia, and the removal of air from the heart after, card uh, after the operation are difficult with this approach. So this incision is particularly useful for valve replacement after a previous uh, uh, procedure with, uh, after redo. Uh, a left anterior lateral thoracotomy performed in a similar fashion to the right side um, in a similar way, uh, may be used for isolated bypass grafting to the left circ uh, or for left-sided exposure of the mitral valve. A left posterior lateral thoracotomy is uh, used for procedure involving uh, the distal aortic arch and descending thoracic aorta. With the left thoracotomy, um, uh, cannulation for cardiopulmonary bypass it must be done through uh, the femoral vessels. Uh, bilateral transverse thoracosternotomy, which is also called the clamshell incision, is made through either the fourth or fifth uh, intercostal space. The incision is extended down through the pectoralis major muscle to enter the hemothorax. Uh, the right and left uh, internal thoracic arteries are dissected and ligated proximally and distally prior to the transverse division of the sternum. Bilateral chest spreaders are placed to maintain uh, the exposure. So this incision, uh, it's for bilateral, uh, for example, for heart-lung uh, transplant because of the enhanced exposure of the epical pleural space. Uh, also, the incision is useful for um, access to the ascending aorta, the aortic arch, and descending thoracic aorta. And that's all for the first lecture. Thank you, Dr. Alaman. I think your uh, lecture was really, uh, you know, I liked it. It was really uh, clear with nice pictures, actually. And you have, mashallah, a nice way of uh, explaining things clearly. Thank you for that. And um, uh, just a comment. So um, I believe that uh, attending, um, attending, you know, more ORs and more um, simulation labs helps any a lot in, um, in, in knowing your anatomy better. So it's, it's just about exposing yourself more and more to, uh, uh, to so such structures so you know them better. Do you agree with that? Yes, of course. Especially simulation, you know, that sometimes in OR you didn't get the chance to get closer to the structure that you wanna see, but in, in simulation and animal labs, dry labs, you get the chance really. Anybody has any question or comments? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. A very great, great lecture, uh, Rawan. Thank you very much for your effort. But um, if you don't mind, can I add a couple of things that I think are important, especially yes, to uh, our new residents? things that I, I used to struggle with regarding the heart anatomy. And uh, till now, I am actually still uh, understanding new things every uh, now and then. Uh, do you mind if I add a couple of things? No, of course. Go ahead, please. Uh, okay. Uh, I add, can I share my screen? Yes. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. Please, Ron. Sure. Okay. 
Do you see my screen? Yes, yes. 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 Uh, one important thing I think everyone needs to understand about uh, heart anatomy is, and something that we all, uh, I was surprised to know this because I think uh, the problem mainly when we study the, the anatomy of the heart is this picture. This picture makes it, makes the heart anatomy very simple while actually it's complex and uh, the heart structures are really uh, like connected and every intervention sometimes you do in one valve or one chamber can affect the other. So uh, I, I apologize Rawan if I repeat uh, anything you have said, but this is important I think for anyone uh, who's starting cardiac surgery. First is the relations of the cardiac chamber. The heart in the chest is not as it is in, this, in the previous picture I showed you. It is slanted. So some structures are more anterior and some structures are more posterior. And this is important. This is something I found in Radiopedia, as you can see in, the, uh, in my screen. So as you can see here, the heart structures are not uh, next to each other. Some of them are more anterior and some of them are more posterior. So if you don't mind, Rawan, do you know what structure is this? Or do you want it to go up and down to make it more clearer? Can you go down? Which, which go. one you, can you put uh, the... Do you see my pointer or you cannot see it? Yeah, this I can one. see it. Yeah, this here, this chamber, what is it? Uh, the left ventricle? No, this is the right ventricle. Right, yeah. Yeah. So that's what I think is a very important thing you need to know. The most anterior chamber is the right ventricle. And this can come in questions, I think, even in the SMLE for our new re uh, resident. It, one of the most common questions is what is the most commonly injured chamber in traumatic uh, chest injury? It is the most anterior uh, structure or chamber, which is the RV. So this is the RV. This is the most anterior. Afterwards, it comes here, the right atrium. This is a venous phase. It is not very clear, the contrast only on the left side, but you can see the right atrium is the next chamber more uh, closer to the chest wall. Afterward, you have the LV. If, you can, if it's not clear, you can stop me if my pointer is not clear. And this is the LV, and the most posterior structure is the left atrium. So these are the, the relationship of the chambers. Even if you go into the OR and you look, the first thing you can see is the RV in your face, then the right atrium. The LV is more posterior, you only can see part of it. And most of the time, I remember until I am R4, I was not able to see the left atrium because it's behind, behind everything. I mean, if you look here, now this is the LV. If you follow the LV, you will have the aortic valve and then the aorta. Behind the aorta, you have the left atrium and the both pulmonary arteries, if you can see here. And this is important thing to know. This is something you can injure. You can, when you put your cross clamp on the aorta, you can grab part of the left atrial appendage. You can perforate the pulmonary artery here. So this, this is an important uh, relationship you need to know. And it's very hard to understand. Uh, it was hard for me. I had to take three years just to see these in the OR and understand their, these relationships. And looking at the CT, really what helped me understand the heart anatomy is I looked at, at a lot of CTs. You can see here the left atrium coming into it, the pulmonary veins. These are the right and these are the left. You know, in the CT, it's the opposite. Okay, I will show you an image, a uh, sagittal image here. You can see here, this is, this is a more uh, arterial and venous phase. This is the SVC, number 32, going into the right atrium, going into the right ventricle. As you can see, it's the most anterior and very close to the sternum. Okay, if we come more forward, you can see this is the LV. Okay, it's circular. This is, you know, an echo, the parasternal long, uh, Axis view is, oh, this is not the parasternal, sorry, long axis view, the short axis view. This is what you see in the echo. And then this is the LV goes back into the left atrium. You can see the left atrium. And this is the aorta. If you put the cross clamp across the aorta, 
you can either perforate this pulmonary artery or catch the left atrial appendage. Uh, is what I'm saying clear or am I making it more difficult or complex? No, it's clear. Faisal, can you go back to the previous one? Okay. This one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this part, this is also uh, a good, yeah, this, this section, it's a good mm -hmm. uh, showing the relationship of the aortic uh, to the cardiac chambers and showing the coronary arteries also. Yeah, you're right. The, the, the pulmonary artery actually starts as anterior to the aortic valve. Okay, and then afterward, it goes backward behind the aorta and behind everything. You only see the start of the pulmonary artery. Okay, I think this is what I can add to the cardiac chamber and these things. Another thing I wanted to add, you mentioned the very important information, but I don't know if you mentioned its clinical significance, which is the papillary muscle. You said the, uh, one of them is do, uh, su uh, supplied by dual arteries and one by one artery, right? Yes. So which one is supplied by one coronary artery? The posterior uh, medial, which is supplied by the uh, RCA. Correct. So what so is the clinical? clinical yeah, it's clinical significance uh, in case of patient presenting with um, ischemia. Okay. Uh, so in case of um, uh, in the uh, posterior medial, you have only one blood supply, the RCA. So if the patient has an RCA um, uh, significant ischemia, uh, he might, the papillary muscle might rupture, uh, right. which in the other, uh, the uh, anterior lateral, which has two blood supply. Mm. So less likely, it can happen, but less likely. So the posterior medial uh, muscle is more prone to yeah. papillary muscle rupture because it has only one supply. So this is the clinical significance. Uh, one last thing I want to add is uh, the phrenic nerve. You mentioned that the right can be injured uh, while doing venous cannulation, right? Yeah. What about the left? Do you know where it, uh, can, how, can, how can it be injured while we are doing surgery? Yeah, the left, it can be injured uh, during, um, I think, the lima harvesting. Okay, that's one. The second thing. No, I'm not sure. Uh, usually, I have seen it multiple times. When we harvest the lima and then we anastomose it to the LAD, in order mm -hmm. to make the lima lies tension-free, the pleural, the pleural, the mediastinal pleura and the pericardium on that area, we would usually cut it or transect it in order for uh, the lima so to go we through. Might, we might reach the phrenic. Yeah, haven't you noticed that the surgeon sometimes before he cuts the pleura, he yeah, will look yeah, inside the chest? He will look, yes. He, he's directly. looking for the lima to avoid cutting it, okay? That's uh, nice. Yeah, that's another thing I want to add. I had other points about the, the award uh, valve, Amr. Everyone, can I speak, please? Yes, Sam. Allah, thank you, Rawan, for your presentation. Uh, and Dr. Faisal, it was very great for your addendum and it was fruitful for the new uh, residents. But, but I think we don't have the whole time for uh, this discussion because this is going to be discussed, inshallah, in next lecture. So uh, let's don't go ahead of ourselves. Uh, can I, can I so add much. one more thing? Uh, the, the last thing I want to, uh, you, want, you need to know that the aortic and the mitral valves are one unit and you will see it in the OR. What if you go uh, attend the double valve case while do, they are doing an aortic valve and they have already done the mitral valve, you will see the mitral valve through the aortic root. And also, if you put a big valve on the mitral side, because they are already a one unit, it will affect your aortic valve. It will make the orifice smaller. This is something to keep in mind. Uh, sorry to take a long time, and uh, thank you very much, Rowan, for a great presentation. Thank you for Abdullah and uh, Ayat for giving me the chance. Thank you so much, Faisal. Thank, uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, thank you, Faisal. Rowan, it was very great uh, speaking. Uh, I don't know if you are ready for the next, or we take five minutes. Uh, Abdel Ila. Yes. We still have a few minutes. Abdullah is raising his hand. Abdullah, do you want to say anything? 
before starting the next lecture. Yes, I, uh, thank you, uh, Fais Aushi. Thank you, Ron. Uh, very nice presentation, pictures, illustrations, and it shows uh, very good understanding. Uh, well done. Uh, Faisal, uh, actually, this is a very nice way to look at it. And I used to look at yani, the same way you look at it uh, the, with CT to understand the anatomy. So I absolutely agree. It helps uh, to understand the anatomy. And I would just add that, um, mashallah, the transplant across the uh, kingdom now, you have in, in the National Guard and military hospital and and King Faisal. Um, so the heart transplant is being done in, in multiple centers. If you just, yani, I believe you will reach the ultimate understanding as a resident uh, uh, in terms of anatomy, in my humble opinion, when the heart is taken out of uh, out the chest, the explanted heart, you can just scrub and stay at the side table and hold the heart and you can turn it over and over and, and examine the anatomy. Absolutely, you'll find some of your senior colleagues around. They will uh, explain the anatomy. I believe this is um, cannot be simulated better than the real heart in front of you, where someone is explaining the anatomy to you and will show you the uh, coronaries, uh, the, the whole anatomy, the chambers, uh, and you can place it in an anatomical uh, position I think this is extremely beneficial uh, in terms of um, understanding the anatomy. And even if you uh, attend one of the harvesting uh, uh, times uh, at different centers, you can understand the anatomy very well. Uh, that's just uh, some part of my experience that I really uh, uh, benefited from. Thank you, everyone. I agree, you're right. Some of uh, my teachers, especially Dr. Rakan told me that the best thing that helped him with the anatomy was the heart transplant. Unfortunately, I haven't had the chance really to attend one. Uh, I totally agree with you guys. Really, it was really beneficial for me. But, but the point is, anatomy, really. Until now, of I'm, course, yeah. I, I, I am learning new things. And this is only the outer, anatomy, outer part of the heart and the chamber relationship. Inside the intracardiac structures and their relationship, I'm just only in the tip of the iceberg. The relationship of the coronary sinus with the, with the, with the tricuspid valve, the fact that you can actually exclude the coronary sinus when you put a patch blindly, when you do an ASD repair, all these things, uh, I am still on the tip of that. So uh, anatomy, uh, for me, until now, I'm learning new things. We, we are always learning, you know, every day we learn new things. Thank you, Faisal. And thank you, everyone, for sharing your um, opinions and experiences. And uh, Rowan, so we can take like three minutes break and then you start your lecture. What do you think? Yeah, sure. We can. Oh, okay. Thank you, guys.
دكتور روان وانس يو ار ريدي يو كان ستارت يا اوكي So I'll start with my second lecture, the anatomy of the great vessels and the coronary vessel. So the great vessels of the heart are uh, located within the mediastinum. The five important vessels which enter and leave the heart are the aorta, the pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary vein, the SVC and IVC. The aorta is the largest artery in the body that carries oxygenated blood um, from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. It arises from the aortic orifice at the base of the left ventricle, pumps blood from the left ventricle to the aorta through the aortic valve. The aorta is divided into four sections, the ascending aorta, the aortic arch, the descending aorta, and the abdominal aorta. The aortic root is the portion of the aorta beginning at the aortic annulus and extending to the sinotubular junction. So the ascending aorta begins at the sinotubular junction. Uh, it is a five centimeter, around five centimeter long, and it runs through a common pericardial sheath with the pulmonary trunk. At the root of the ascending aorta, we have the aortic sinuses or the sinuses of Valsalva, which give rise to the coronary arteries. The left aortic sinus, it contains the origin of the left coronary artery. The right aortic sinus uh, give rise to the right coronary artery and uh, the posterior or the non-coronary sinus uh, does not give any coronary artery. After that, we have the aortic arch. Uh, it the aortic arch uh, loops over the left pulmonary artery and the bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk. It has a three, major, uh, three major branches from proximal to distal. They are the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. The brachiocephalic trunk, which further divides uh, into the right subclavian and the common carotid artery supplies the right side of the head and neck as well as the right arm and chest wall. While the left common carotid artery and left subclavian artery together supply the left side of the same regions. The aortic arch uh, ends and the descending thoracic aorta begins at the level of uh, um, between um, uh, the fourth and fifth thoracic vertebra. The thoracic descending gives rise to many branches, the intercostal and subcostal arteries, as well as the superior and inferior left bronchial arteries, and uh, many branches to the esophagus, mediastinum, and pericardium. Its lowest pair of branches are the superior phren phrenic artery, which supply, which supply the diaphragm and the uh, intercostal and subcostal arteries. It leaves the thorax um, through the aortic hiatus in the diaphragm at the level of T12, where it becomes the abdominal aorta. The abdominal aorta begins at the aortic hiatus, uh, as I said, at the level of T12. It is approximately 13 centimeter long. It gives rise to the lumbar uh, musculophrenic arteries, the renal and middle uh, su suprarenal arteries, and visceral arteries the, like the celiac trunk and the superior and inferior mesenteric artery. It ends at the level of L4 vertebra by bifurcating into the left and right common iliac arteries. The pulmonary arteries uh, receive deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle and deliver it to the lung for gas uh, exchange to take place. The arteries begin as the pulmonary trunk, um, a thick and short vessel which is separated from the right ventricle by the pulmonary valve. The trunk is located anteriorly and medially to the right atrium, sharing a common layer of pericardium with the ascending aorta. It continues upward, overlapping the root of the aorta and passing posteriorly. 
at around the level of T5, uh, T6, the pulmonary trunk splits into the right and left main pulmonary arteries. The left pulmonary artery supplies blood to the left lung, bifurcating into two branches to supply each lobe of the lung. The right pulmonary artery is uh, the thicker and longer artery supplying blood to the, uh, to the other side. The pulmonary veins uh, receive oxygenated blood from the lung, delivering it to the left side of the heart. Uh, there are four uh, pulmonary veins with one superior and one inferior for each of the lung. Uh, they enter the pericardium to drain into the superior left atrium on the posterior surface. The, uh, the superior pulmonary vein uh, return the blood from the upper loops of the lung with the inferior vein returning blood from the lower loops of the lung. The SBC receives deoxygenated blood from the upper body. So all the structures superior to the diaphragm, excluding the lung and the heart, uh, and delivering it back to the, uh, delivering it to the right atrium. It is formed by merging of the brachiocephalic veins, traveling inferiorly through the thoracic region until draining into the superior portion of the right atrium at the level of the third rib. The inferior vena cava receives the deoxygenated blood from the lower body, so all the structures inferior to the diaphragm, delivering it back to the heart. It is initially formed by, in the pelvis by the common iliac vein joining together, travels through the abdomen, collecting blood from the hepatic, lumbar, uh, renal, and phrenic nerve, uh, phrenic veins. The inferior vena cava then uh, they passes through the diaphragm, entering the pericardium at the level of T8, and it drains into the inferior portion of the right atrium. Um, there are two primary coronary arteries, the right coronary system and the left coronary system. Uh, both of them originate from the right and left coronary sinus in the aortic root. Uh, they run along the coronary sulcus of the myocardium. Um, because of the oblique plane of the aortic valve, the, uh, uh, the orifice of the left coronary artery is superior and posterior to the, uh, compared to the right coronary artery. So an easy way to memorize the course of the coronary arteries, the major coronary arteries form a circle and a loop around the heart. So the circle is formed by the right coronary and left uh, circumflex artery as they course along the right and left atrioventricular groove. The loop is formed by the LED and the PDA as they encircle uh, the anterior and posterior interventricular septum. So the right coronary artery courses uh, anteriorly and laterally from its origin at the right coronary ostium, uh, descending into the right atrioventricular groove and inferiorly towards the uh, acute margin of the right ventricle. It courses around to the inferior surface of the heart and after giving the PDA, it continues as, as the posterior lateral artery. The main branches of the RCA include the, sino, uh, the SA nodal artery, which as we said uh, earlier, in 55% of the patient, it originates from the RCA and 45% of the patient coming from the left circ. The infundibular or conus branch that courses anteriorly uh, over the right ventricular infundibulum. The acute marginal branch that courses uh, anteriorly over, uh, that uh, courses over the acute margin of the right ventricle. Um, the anterior right ventricular branch that supply the anterior free wall of the right ventricle, 
the AV nodal artery, which in 85 to 90% of the patient, it originates from the RCA, but the 10 to 50%, it can come from the left circ. The PDA, which also in 85 to 90% of the patient originate from the RCA, and 10 to 15%, it can come uh, uh, from the left circ. Uh, finally, the posterior lateral artery that supply the posterior surface of the left ventricle. So the dominance refers to the artery from which the PDA originate. It's not the vessel which supply the uh, larger myocardial muscle mass. So a right dominant system uh, in 80 to 85%, uh, where PDA is a terminal branch of the RCA. Left dominant, as I said, in 10 to 15%, where PDA is a terminal branch of the left circumflex artery. And the co-dominant uh, system where it comes from both uh, RCA and left circ, which occurs in around um, approximately 5% of the patients. The left main artery, uh, it courses from the left ostium anteriorly and inferiorly to the left between the pulmonary trunk and the uh, between the uh, pulmonary trunk and the left atrial appendage to reach the AV groove. Typically, it is around uh, 10 to 20 millimeter in length. It can extend to 40 millimeter. Uh, it divides into two major arteries, uh, the LAD and the left circumflex. In some cases, the left main stem can be absent with the separate um, orifice of, uh, in the sinus of Valsalva for its two primary branches uh, in around 1% of the patients. Also, in some occasions, uh, instead of bifurcating into two, it can trifurcate into three vessels, the LED, the left circ, and the ramus. The ramus intermediate occurs in around 10 to 20% of patients and is considered a normal variant. Uh, it generally goes in the angle between the LED and the left circ. It may either behave, behave like, uh, it can be like uh, a large uh, OM or diagonal branch, and it supplies the lateral free wall of the LV. The LED, uh, also known as the anterior uh, interventricular artery, as it descends along the interventricular groove to the apex of the heart. Part of it may be uh, buried in the muscle, the main branches of the LED include the diagonal arteries, which are usually two to six uh, in number and course along and supply the anterior lateral wall of the left ventricle. The septal perforator arteries, which usually uh, three to five in number and branch perpendicular, uh, perpendicular to the LED and supply the anterior two third of the ventricular septum. The right ventricular branch would supply blood to the anterior surface of the right ventricle. The LED is divided into three segments, proximal, middle, and distal segment. A proximal uh, third, which runs from the origin of the uh, LED to the origin of the first septal artery. A middle third, which runs from the first septal artery to the origin of the last diagonal artery. And the distal third, which runs from the last diagonal artery to the termination of the LED. So uh, the circumflex artery courses along the left atrioventricular groove and terminates before reaching the posterior inter ventricular groove. The main branches of the circumflex uh, artery includes the uh, OM, the obtuse marginal, 
that supply the lateral aspect of the left ventricle wall, including the anterior lateral papillary muscle of the mitral valve, the left atrial branches, the SA nodal branches, as I mentioned, in 45%, the AV nodal in 10 to 15% of patients, and the PDA also in 10 to 15% of patients. So the papillary muscle blood supply, uh, I mentioned this earlier, the anterior lateral papillary muscle of the RV uh, supplied by branches from the LED, the anterior lateral papillary muscle supplied by branches from the LED and left circ, and the posterior medial papillary muscle, which has a single uh, blood supply from the RCA. Um, a complex uh, network of veins drain the coronary circulation. Uh, it returns the deoxygenated blood from the myocardium back to the right atrium. It either drains to the right atrium through the coronary sinus or drains directly to the right atrium by passing the coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus predominantly uh, drains around uh, 85% of coronary venous blood uh, from the left ventricle. It lies within the posterior atrioventricular groove and empties into the right atrium at the lateral border of the triangle of Koch. We have two systems, the great system and the smaller system. In the great system, the majority of coronary vein drains to the coronary sinus into the right atrium which uh, drains the sub-epicardial uh, myocardium. They are the great cardiac vein, the middle cardiac vein, and the small cardiac vein. Larger anterior cardiac vein drains directly into the right atrium, so bypassing the coronary sinus. The smaller system consists of small cardiac veins called the Thebesian veins, they drain the subendocardial myocardium and they drain directly to whatever chamber they are uh, adjacent to. So they are present more in the right, uh, right atrium and right ventricle compared to the left side. So this table shows each coronary vein and the corresponding coronary artery which it runs with. The coronary sinus, which runs along the left atrioventricular groove in the posterior side of the heart, along with the left uh, circumflex artery. Uh, the great cardiac vein, which runs in the anterior interventricular groove into the uh, left atrioventricular groove with the LED and the left circ. The middle cardiac vein, uh, which runs in the posterior interventricular groove along with the PDA. And finally, the small cardiac vein, which runs uh, the right atrioventricular groove uh, along with the RCA and the acute marginal artery. So uh, the last three slides I'll talk about is the anatomy of uh, the internal mammary artery, the radial artery, and the saphenous vein. So starting with the internal mammary artery, which originate from the subclavian artery, uh, it travels along the inner surface of the anterior chest wall on both sides, uh, about two to three centimeters on either side of the sternum and is slightly medial to the nipple, uh, accompanied by the large internal thoracic vein uh, that also follow the same course. The internal thoracic artery runs under the fascia and deep to the intercostal muscle. It give off some uh, branches that supply the mediastinum, the pericardium, um, and the breast. Uh, also, at each intercostal space, it gives off uh, anterior and posterior intercostal arteries. So when it reaches the sixth or seventh intercostal cartilage, uh, it divides into, uh, it bifurcates into two branches, the musculophrenic and the superior epigastric arteries. Uh, 
the radial artery is one of the uh, it's one of the two terminal branches of the brachial artery uh, located medial to the biceps tendon. It's divided into three parts, proximal, middle, and distal. So the proximal part, which lies between its origin and the distal uh, extent of the antecubital fossa. The middle part, which extends from the uh, antecubital fossa to the uh, origin of the brachioradialis tendon, uh, the extensor carvi radialis longus, and the extensor carvi radialis brevis. The distal part, which uh, runs from the origin of these tendons to the uh, wrist. So it courses underneath the brachioradialis muscle, give branches which are, uh, give, uh, it gives branches that are the recurrent radial artery, the superficial palmar artery, and the muscular, uh, some muscular branches also. Terminates at the level of the radial styloid process and continues as the deep palmar artery. So um, there is a risk of uh, nerve injury during harvesting of the radial artery that it's important to know. The lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, which carries a sensory fiber to the lateral aspect of the forearm, the superficial radial nerve, which crossed the anatomical snuff box and carries uh, sensory fibers to the thenar muscle. Uh, finally, the saphenous, uh, the saphenous vein, the great saphenous vein, also known as the long saphenous vein, is a large subcutaneous superficial vein and almost the longest vein in the body originate from um, the communication between the dorsal vein of the big toe, which merges with the dorsal venous arch of the foot, anterior and superior to the medial malleolus. Uh, at this site, it often can be visualized and palpated there. So uh, as I said, anterior and superior to the medial malleolus, it then ascend at first medial and then slightly posterior to the medial aspect of the tibia. The vein then passes medial to the knee around five centimeter posterior to the medial aspect of the patella. From the knee, the vein uh, continues up uh, the medial aspect of the thigh to join the common femoral vein in the femoral triangle at the saphenofemoral junction. That's all. Thank you so much, uh, Rowan, for this uh, great lectures uh, and fruitful uh, sessions. Uh, any questions from the audience, please? Uh, can I add one thing? <clears throat> yes, Faisal. Yes, go ahead. Uh, there is, regarding the radial artery anatomy, uh, there was uh, uh, like a mnemonic uh, given to us by Dr. Khaled uh, Al-Atebi, uh, one of the, our first uh, graduating residents, uh, regarding the important things to know about the radial artery, especially when harvesting it. Uh, can I share the screen? I have a good picture here of the radial yeah. artery. Sure. One second. The rule is two branches, two muscles, two nerves. Uh, things that you should worry about. Can you see now my screen or not? Yes, Faisal, it's clear. Yeah, so two muscles, the brachioradialis and the flexor carboradialis muscle. These are the ones that the radial artery goes with. The radial artery is under the uh, brachioradialis and uh, bounded medially by the flexor carpi uh, radialis muscle. These are the two muscles. Two branches, you have the superficial palmar artery and the recurrent radial artery. These are your limits for harvesting. You stop proximally by the recurrent radial and distally by the superficial 
palmar artery. And the two nerves that you can injure, one which runs on the edge of the brachioradialis muscle, this one. I don't know, can I have another a better uh, marker? Can you see my pointer? Is it uh, clear? Yes, first all, it's clear. Yeah, so the two nerves are the late lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve and uh, the, the superficial radial nerve. These are the most commonly injured nerves. So two, 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 two muscles, two branches, two nerves. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Faisal, and uh, for uh, the presenters. Uh, any more questions or addendum? In regards of uh, Savina's uh, vein, Abdelila, do you usually yes. see um, the same anatomy as uh, uh, in the picture that Rowan presented? Or you get some, sometimes, you know, confused uh, during harvest? Yeah, yeah exactly, after. exactly. Yeah. Uh, Rowan, can you show the last uh, picture that you've shown? Yeah, sure. Mm. Because I wanna, I wanna reach a point, you know, that we can yeah, discuss yeah. about this savviness. I got it, but it's different. It's individualized because regarding the patients, one of the patients fat, one of the patients their veins are. Uh, uh, yeah. Because it's different. Uh, if you can see, uh, the, it's individualized. Uh, one of the patients are fat. One of the patients are thin. Uh, one of the patients are very thin that you can see the veins through the skin before incision. And one of yeah. the patients you can get deep uh, and you couldn't find and you couldn't uh, uh, differentiate between uh, the veins or the sometimes the nerves running along the vein. So you wouldn't uh, appreciate it. So it depends on the patient. Uh, itself and it depends on your incision which is uh, to be uh, proximal to the medial malleolus two centimeters and go on but uh, I think this picture is uh, is a standard that we can uh, go on okay and go with your point uh, Ayat. yeah because sometimes you know um, I, I harvested many I know still I need to harvest more and more because uh, so yeah, anyway, we are in the beginning but um, I noticed that some patients, they have different anatomy. So sometimes you see two branches and you don't know what to take. Both of them are big and you look for, for the anatomy, you look for the course and it will be difficult to decide which, which is which. And some, as you said, they are really um, obese. As also females, they are really difficult. So it's not like this, it's, it's not like this picture only. It depends on the patient. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's right. And sometimes I have, I when have the... a, a picture um, of a vein, uh, it's just a part of, of the patient's leg. It's really, really clear. You know, you, you, I was really scared that I'm, I, when I put my um, scalpel, it's going to be um, injured because it was really clear. The patient was 10 and he was a male. So it was really clear. I, I can send it in the group, just a part of the, of the leg. The yeah, yeah, you can send it, please. Yeah. One thing you can do to avoid uh, this uh, variation in, in anatomy is to do venous mapping before the surgery. You just uh, yeah, do but we don't do it usually. Uh, first. I, yeah, Actually, this uh, this uh, this is the this luxury visa we couldn't find it in uh, all hospitals. That uh, for me, I've never done it unless the patient has DVT or a history of DVTs that we can do this. Otherwise, uh, we just go on and uh, did it anatomically. You can, yeah. Yes, uh, I asked, can we can we add the picture that you have, please? Uh, well, I don't know where is it now, so I will just share it on the group. I will just cut the things and then it's okay. I will it's suggest fine. the thing. So you are right, Faisal, but still, you know, you, we don't usually do it uh, unless there is something that we are worried about or, for example, DVT or something. But uh, I think it's beneficial, you know. When you do mapping, you yeah, and you look for the point that you go into instead of opening uh, the whole things. Sometimes we open up to the thigh just to to find something. The, exactly. There are patients are really difficult. I really, think we can do it. Things. I think we can do it ourselves. The venous mapping. You just exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No yeah. Need for the... mm. uh, Ayat, can we just? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, one of the once we are just going to harvest the vein, uh, sometimes after one, five or two centimeters, we have uh, noticed that the vein is a small caliber. So we're just asking our uh, 
consultant can we proceed or no uh, <clears throat> i see one of them or most of them sorry they, they just uh, say you no know, go for other legs and look for bigger caliber because sometimes it's small and you cannot it's worthless to uh, extend to the femoral but sometimes we don't extend it's, yeah. uh, if it is small Abdelilah, but yeah, yeah but sometimes, sometimes they proceed La, yani sometimes the consultant will, will ask you to open the five, the for example, leg. or the exactly. other leg. Yeah, but, exactly. but still, yani, some patients are difficult. I, I face this. Some females are really obese, and a female, uh, per se, a female uh, yani, has um, smaller veins than a male. Exactly. Yes, that's yeah. right. Thank you so much. This is uh, really a good point. Uh, any further uh, extra, please? Can I add a comment, please? Please, yeah. Yeah, so uh, regarding the point that you are mentioning for to check the, the pain, I also agree with Faisal and uh, Abdelilah. What you can do, I think, to grab an, uh, just an ultrasound from the anesthesia or even in the ICU yourself. You do simple mapping. You don't need like an official one. You take the smaller uh, Doppler and then you see yourself well, uh, can i just add i've never i've never seen it and i've never uh, uh no, we have seen or okay La, but you, i mean you, oh can, my, uh, you can because the ultrasound machine you it's close by usually yeah, yeah. they are using for the central venous right exactly yes, exactly yeah. uh, what i yes. mean what i meant abdelilah no yeah and we can develop you know uh, a good habit let's say and no this, is, uh, this is really good it is really good wallah what uh but I've and never this is what we have done for a uh, few patients, uh, Amjad. We have done uh, ultrasound in them, and we got um, uh, a good um, a piece of vein uh, up there in the thigh. We did it with the ultrasound because we couldn't. It was really difficult and deep. Exactly. So we, yes, we, yes. we, we took in the female. ultrasound and we did it. Exactly. I agree. Dr. Fred is raising uh, his hand. Dr. Fred, do you want to comment? Yes, please. Uh, two yeah. points. First, the point that Amjad have raised, which is using the ultrasound mapping before surgery, it's becoming um, um, a good uh, quality standard for many uh, centers. Um, something for you maybe to perfect uh, during those years, seven years, because I think it's uh, a very good technique. It can save the patients from developing uh, flaps uh, when you do the dissection. The second point was about uh, is the uh, saphenous vein uh, too small uh, to be used? Um, in my old experience, and I, I believe it's still valid, it's never too small. Even the smallest uh, branch that you have, you still can use with very good results. Actually, it will match very much with the coronary. And it's not necessarily the bigger the vein size, uh, is better for the bypass. Actually, it may be uh, more problematic uh, developing uh, future lesions, uh, atherosclerotic lesions, and thrombus uh, formation. So uh, if you are faced with, uh, and by the way, it's a contraindication to use these varicose veins uh, uh, if you see any. Um, if you see uh, during your dissection as you go on and you see the veins suddenly become very small, uh, the big thing is to ask yourself why, and that usually can get you the answer. And many times you have a deeper branch that's it is probably the, the proper uh, uh, longer saphenous vein, but you have missed it and you went for a smaller uh, superficial branch. So if you dissect, if you go back again and uh, retrograde a little bit and start dissect into, into that area, that will be better. I'm not sure where do you start usually your uh, dissection. Um, we used to do it, depends on the uh, surgeon preference, either the, uh, the thigh or in the, um, or in the, uh, uh, in the foot near uh, just superior and anterior to the uh, median malleolus. But um, if you start distal, you have very little chance that you will be missing um, a major branch. If you start proximal, um, it's always a, a concern. And we use that occasionally when you need only a small or short uh, segment. So that's something to keep in mind. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so much, Dr. Farid. 
about that one that we we miss sometimes the 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 uh, the main course and we go to another one i face this a lot and uh, and and you change your plan and you go to the other one and in regards to starting with the, the starting point you are saying dr Hogir, that we might go uh, more distal or more proximal i remember one um of the consultants was saying that you have to leave a space between the malleolus and uh, the starting point so uh, the patient can wear the shoes and uh, they don't get infection. I, 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 yani, I was like um, doing it, but uh, not for three fingers, four fingers. But, and then we got a patient with an infection. So he said, this is a teaching um, point. This is a lesson. So you leave um, a space. Do you agree with this? Um, okay, this is not science. So it's personal preference. Um, yeah. And um, I must say, occasionally we have went with the dissection all the way to the foot. If you have a very mm. good distal vein, you can go even beyond the malleolus and into the foot itself. So yes, you, you can do things. Um, you, you do whatever you think is best for your patient. If, there, if that patient is high risk for infection, um, for one reason or another, diabetic and having diabetic foot already and maybe having an ulcer, uh, yeah, it's better to avoid uh, distal uh, uh, dissection. So we start with those patients and the groin, but it, you just cannot rule out or cannot um, absolutely protect the patient from developing infections um, uh, if you save a few centimeters, I, I don't think so. Yeah. But again, I go back and say, this is personal preference. Uh, I would not, if the consultant asks you to do that, please abide by it and uh, learn your way as you go. And maybe after seven years, you will have your own way. For sure, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fred. Anybody else has any comment? Share your experiences, guys. Yes, uh, just uh, one last comment. Uh, uh, from my side, one comment, a tiny comment. To, to avoid missing a bigger branch, one uh, uh, tip is to expose the whole segment of the vein. Let's say you're, uh, you're harvesting three segments uh, of a graft. So try to expose the uh, whole uh, segments and then try, uh, start tying. Don't start tying as, uh, as you go, as you cutting the skin or as you incising the skin. If you start tying the branches early, you might just miss a, 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 a more bigger branch, which is deeper. <clears throat> but when you expose the whole thing, and then you, if it gets smaller, you look for a deeper one. And then uh, when you expose the uh, whole segment of the vein, then you start tying the branches to avoid accidentally tying the actual main one. Uh, yeah, exactly, Abdullah. But uh, yani, you know, some patients, they, they have the vein courses uh, with the typical anatomy. So you go with it. And then all of a sudden you find that it's not the one. It's getting smaller and smaller. So uh, it's not typical, you know. And of course, yeah, you don't tie um, immediately. You expose first. You are right, Yanni. Exactly. So if you see, if you see larger branches, do not... Uh... Uh, cut it out, just like Abdullah said. But actually what you need to do is dissect more in both areas and find mm -hmm. out which one is bigger uh, that you can use. Occasionally, yeah. the, uh, the bifurcation of the venous system will be helpful in a way that you can use it for um, as a bifurcated graft. Uh, so do not, do not miss that opportunity, okay? Uh, so you'll have only one proximal anastomosis and two distal anastomosis. That can happen only if the uh, if you, the, your dissection is from proximal, uh, sorry, from distal to proximal, so starting at the foot and going up, and you find the bifurcation, those are very good uh, opportunities uh, uh, and branches. Sometimes they are equal and good enough for both uh, to be used. Yeah, exactly. I remember we used them both. So uh, I remember Dr. Fras said, "No, don't don't cut it. I will take it," and he took it. We anastomosed that one. It was a branch, big one, big and long. Uh, I, I believe we don't have a third lecture. What, what's going on? 
Yeah, I think we don't have a third picture as uh, I already mentioned in that group. For, for you guys, I mean, you are here, uh, what, uh, 50, 40 people. Um, I'm sure some of you will have something to, to give. And, and this is just a, um, a friendly advice. Um, this is your time. Uh, you, you have this protected time by the Saudi Council for you to benefit as much as possible from negotiation, from presentation and things like this. You can easily um, make some time for Jonah clubs, for example, or one of you guys uh, may have read a recent article that can present to the group. So please do not miss that opportunity. Do not waste your own time and everybody else. Um, try to invest in this. Uh, well, you remember when you have gray hair, I guess that those moments are precious moments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Farid. Uh, thanks for the audience and the speakers. Uh, I think we are done with this uh, session today. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, is there anybody collecting the presentations, Abdullah? Uh, I think we are done. We are done for today. What I no what no I no. Know. I mean, collecting presentations uh, so we can upload them because some residents are asking for. Yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, Dr. Abdullah or Dr. Loi, they are aware of this. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much.